We do this every time. How you guys doing? How you guys doing? That was good because you're on Facebook Live now, I think, and Instagram. Give everybody a wave. Everybody a wave. There you go. Say hi, Facebook. Hi, Instagram. That's probably not what am I doing. Snapchat? Whatever. Yay. Okay, guys, very exciting now. This is really, really, really good. Okay. This lady is a star of Netflix. An executive chef at Mumbai restaurant Arth. Marco Pierre White, recently quite controversial, and we'll get into <laughs> that. He's a massive fan. Bowled over by this super talented lady. If you want a taste of Mumbai, you've got it. Winner of the National Ministry of Tourism's Best Lady Chef Award. Ladies and gentlemen, a lover of fire, Amninder Sandhu. Namaste. Woo! Hiya. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to talk about gender straight away, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Have we got, Andrew, can we turn Amninder just up a slight bit on our headset? Brilliant. Um, the reason why I want to talk about it is I don't know if people caught the headlines over the last couple of days, but Marco Pierre White, if you're here, if you are here, dude, get up here and answer this. But he made a statement that women are very emotional in the kitchen. And men can absorb more pressure as a result. True again, this gentleman bravely said after... <laughs> how many beers have you had? <laughs> Dutch courage, enough. So what I want to ask you, because obviously, I think gender is a very interesting subject, especially in India. Yeah. Do you agree with Marco? No. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't understand what his... Um, um, what does he mean when he says men absorb pressure better and women are too emotional? I don't understand absorb, I mean what he means by that. If he thinks that women at a high pressure situation in a kitchen would probably start crying and run away and not be able to handle the situation, then I think he's totally wrong. Well, you've never done that, have you? No, never. Look at this event. And how many women, I mean the top organizers are all women in here. And they've got so much done. So I don't think, and, and I don't think emotion should be um, ever used in a derogatory way. I do, I've been able to do a lot that I've done in my career is because I'm emotional and my emotions drive me. And uh, that's the reason I'm the uh, only chef in India who's um, got rid of gas and I cook on charcoal and wood and I've designed my own equipment and um, in a country of a billion people, all because of my emotions. We love emotional people. Uh, can I just say I'm very in tune with my own emotions? Not really. Okay, um, so... Take it out. I want to ask you about the award you got, because it's quite... Uh, oh, is that sore? <laughs> it's a fork <laughs> and a spoon, and it's me. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Libby. Uh, I introduced you as somebody who had won this award, and I think that's why, what, what, again, it, it, it falls on gender. The Best Lady Chef Award. Does that kind of grate with you, if you get me? Because surely just be best chef. Yeah, it should be. But I think it's a good start for India to at least recognize a female chef. And so I just feel it's a good start. But we sh it should be the best chef and not lady chef. So the distinction between the genders is quite prevalent in Indian culinary world. You'd agree? It's still very male dominated. And uh, there is progress. But it's still slow and hard to find. I mean, how many chief execs, lady chief execs of restaurants are there? There's you and, is there a handful? Is there many? Maybe four or five. Four or five yeah. out of a population of? A billion. Yeah. That is, that's, yeah, it's a thing <laughs> to celebrate, but it's also completely bonkers. Okay, so what specific challenges have you had to face in that environment? When I started out, I was, you know, told straight out on my face that you're not good enough. You're too skinny, you're too small, you can't lift weights, you'll not make it, you're good for nothing. And so I had to constantly work harder and make sure people notice me and, uh, yeah, work longer hours and take my job super seriously. And it, This is my true calling, and so I never second-guessed it, and I showed up to work every single day to face that struggle. How did you know it was your true calling? I'm still looking for mine. It <laughs> it How did you find your true calling? How does that happen? <laughs> it was super dramatic, like it happens in the movies. I was in the... I came to Mumbai when I was 17 to study science. 
And uh, one day I was looking out of the lab and extracting DNA at the test tube in my hand <laughs> and like lightning struck and I <laughs> decided to become a chef. Yeah, that's how it happened. But it was because of my roommate. We had a little hot plate in a common area in the hostel and I used to make things like uh, scrambled eggs and instant noodles. And even that, she used to say, you know, when you make it, it's so different, you should become a chef. And I laughed it off saying that, you know, this is not how you become a chef. But she planted the seed in my head. And I come from a family where my mom always tried to make things. As far as food was concerned, she would always try and up the game. You know, if she could not source an ingredient, she would grow it in a kitchen garden. We went for picnics to forests where my uncle used to teach us how to fish and whatever we would catch, he would stuff it into a bamboo, throw it on open fire to cook. And all of that came together that day when I was looking out of the window and I decided to become a chef. So it's a real light bulb moment. <laughs> really? It's a real eureka, there it is, there's yeah. the calling. And how did your parents respond when you went back and said, I don't want to be a scientist anymore? Uh, my dad wanted me to become a doctor. You know, with Indian parents, it's I either engineer or doctor. There's no other third profession, so yeah. So uh, my dad was like, I don't even know what being a chef is because there weren't any, you know, I come from the northeastern part of India, from Jorat, it's a tiny town. So he's like, he didn't know what being a chef was except for very few shows on TV. So he says, whatever you do, there should be dignity in your profession. And uh, yeah, he was, I mean, in the beginning, he resisted it a little bit, but then he was okay. When he saw me work hard, he was okay. Do you feel, it's, it's a bit of a heavy question, but do you feel like you're a pioneer for female chefs in India? <laughs> Is that a heavy weight? Is that, are you even conscious of that, or you just get on no, with your day-to-day? -day? No, but I feel happy when young uh, female chefs walk up to me and they say that I've inspired them in some way and that they see some light at the end of a tunnel. So yeah, I feel good about that. One thing we've been talking about throughout the entire day is the importance of travel. Oh yeah. And how all these guys and girls are traveling. And I want to talk to you about your own personal traveling because you really yeah. traveled the length and breadth of yeah. India. Yeah. So get into that a bit. You know, was, so you had your eureka moment, and then did you realize, well, hang on, for me to learn or for me to yeah. get on with what I need to do, I need to travel, I need to get out there and start discovering stuff. So how, you know, how, was that, how did you tr finance that trip? How does one just go and <coughs> travel India? The thing is that because the kitchens that I was training in, uh, people were just unnecessarily mean. And with Indian cuisine, it's not very, it's not documented too well. You can't really look up a recipe and get somewhere. And some of the very skill sensitive traditional recipes are closely guarded secrets by the cooks from the royal families or, you know, uh, just families of cooks. So I realized that the more I travel and meet people is the best way to learn. And that's how I learned, you know, if anyone ever said, you know, my mom makes this really well or my grandmother makes this well, I would make sure I meet that mom or the grandmother and learn that from them. And I started a coastal restaurant uh, in Mumbai and that was my the first restaurant where I traveled the entire coastline to gather recipes. And that's when I learned, understood that traveling would is the only way to learn. I was everybody willing to share? Sorry? Was everybody willing to share? Oh yeah, the um, people in villages are very open to sharing. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> wow, anybody else got that? So right, I mean, I got <laughs> before you, before you, just before you get into it, I, we've got so much to talk about with this fascinating lady. But let's get into what's happening right let's now put with it this. On, let's put it on. Before you all choke. Drink more beer, drink more beer. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about what we're cooking before we kill everybody in the audience. <laughs> Just two more minutes, I'm just going to get the skin crispy and then take it off and cook it over the wood. So this is, uh, it's called mango wood smoked chicken at my restaurant, but since we could not source mango wood here, I'm using apple wood to smoke it. Are you getting those flavors in the front? Are you getting that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's take So it. what are these... Give me an example of what ingredients we're using here now to give this a particular Indian so style. So this has got Naga Bhujalakya, which is the ghost pepper. And let me warn you, it's going to be spicy, but not so spicy that you can't handle it. I've seeped it in oil and I've used that oil in the marinade. You have been warned, people. <laughs> yes. You eat the spice, you could be... Yes, make sure you've got a cold beer Let's in your hand. Let's take it off. Okay. Or water. So... You very, very speedily went through his ingredients, and I caught one of them, which is the pepper. So just go back slowly through the ingredients, where, you, where they source from, how they're used, and yeah. 
so the Naga ghost pepper is from the state of Nagaland in the northeastern part of India. And it's the hottest chili in the world until some hybrids of it, like Infinity and all. So these made. guys are about to get the hottest chili in the world. Yeah. So, so <laughs> if it, if if a regular chili is hundred Scoville units, this will be ten million Scoville units. I don't know, but it's ten million, which is a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And show me what you do, because there's a massive flame there cooking this chicken. So just tell me. So this chicken you make sure is it doesn't burn, that it cooks the way it should cook. How we, yeah. Yeah. So this, it's it's got the skin on, and so we've just charred the skin on the hot plate, and now we're gonna cook it over the woods. Okay. And Which serve it with a mango salad and coriander chutney. Okay. So mango salad and coriander chutney is what you're gonna get with this amazing dish, and of course the hottest chili in the world. Yeah. Now, talk to us a little bit about the wood. Mark. Yeah, we'll get Mark on in a second, but just you tell me a little bit briefly about this particular wood that you're using and what types of wood to use with what meat. Why is this wood for this chicken? I use a lot of mango wood because it's uh, easily available in India and it has beautiful flavor. I also use almond wood. Um, right now here we are using apple wood and the reason for using it is that uh, the acidity in a raw mango is similar to the acidity in green apple cooking apples and uh, that's the reason we're using the wood. Now that brings us nicely back onto Mark Parr. Put your hand up if you know Mark Parr. Put your hands up anyway, make him feel good, make him feel good, yeah. So can we get Mark on please, which is Mr. Lord Loggs himself, to talk about let's the wood, because let's cut the, the story of the wood, and put it on. okay, let's of what wood is being it. used for no. this particular chicken is interesting. So can we just double check? Yes, lovely. Mark, you're live. Don't swear or say, yeah. Yeah. as children, don't say that either. No, no, F, no. no. Um, so just tell us briefly, so yeah. well not briefly, go on with it as long as you want, but talk to us about the wood, what wood are you asked to source, etc., and what happened? Okay, so when, uh, when, we, when we see uh, chefs that travel here, um, and we, we want to look at their dishes, because we want to try and find something that is either replicates wholly, or that we can find something which has a similar dynamic to it. So the original request we had was for some mango wood, Oh, that was a request from Aninda yeah. herself. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So th originally, it was a mango wood. So we, because of the way we resource and network, we have uh, contacts in places like California where they grow mangoes. And they grow mangoes in a particularly dry area, and they have a particular sweetness and a particular balance of acidity. So we made a request to our people out there, can you bring some mango wood for us? But there's very strict rules in California about wood. And they wow. were the mango wood when it burns, there is on this the cusp nice. of whether they can move it out of the out of the state. So, so we we it was going to be too difficult to bring the mango wood from there, and maybe possibly you know we could look for another resource. So what we do is we look into the soil type, and we look into the pH of the soil, and we're looking for around 6.7 to grow that sort of fruit. Um, I've been to India and I've been down in the south where mangoes grow prolifically and it's a similar soil type. Um, and so mm. in the acidity, uh, places like yeah. Suffolk and Somerset have a similar balance to it. So if we look at fruit woods like apple, if you think of the acidity of a, a cooking apple, if you put raw cooking apple in your mouth and if you put the raw stone of a mango in your mouth, there's a similar acidic balance in there. So what we did is we had a chat with, a, with, um, with the chef to say, look, this is what we think will work, and hence why we're doing what we're doing. So we can get wood here that has the same family and has the same sort of profile notes. And uh, so that's what we got going on here. So you're getting the same taste, but just using different... Yeah, because they're, within, they're more alike than different. I think smaller. But I mean, it's a very specific thing we're looking for. So we can try and think in the sort of aromatic and the aromatic library we have. Um, and try and find something closer to home that we can use, and that's what we came we came with. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, so. so I think it's really important, you know, what different types of wood go with different types of food. It's something that all the chefs have been talking about today, and I think it's something to be quite conscious of. Like I'm lucky enough to have a cherry tree in my back garden, and I well I use it for everything because I've got a cherry tree. I'm not going yeah. <laughs> to source exactly. any other wood, but the flavours it brings out through, you know, a very very simple <laughs> barbecue. It's extraordinary. Yeah, exactly, and, th and that's a really interesting thing. <laughs> when you eat a cherry, it's two things. A cherry is a sweet and a, an acidity, it's a sensation. And then they, there's an aromatic in it. Yeah. So when you cook it for a barbecue, you get that come through. But a, a cherry is a very unique thing. Uh, if anybody tries to have cherry, ju cherry juice, 
it doesn't taste like cherries. It tastes more like almonds. Yeah. So it's, um, it has a more medicinal note to it because it's, it's within the skin. So, I mean, we work with a cherry producer in Kent that produces 14 types of cherries. So they come in a week between each other and through the season they start yeah, off so. quite sharp and acidic and towards okay. the end they're almost like plums. And that's because we've had these long hot days, the sugar content rises, the polysaccharides rises. So each one you know, has its acidic sort of value. That chicken looks great. Chicken looks amazing. <laughs> yeah. So just talk, us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Parr. Thank you. Any questions about wood before you let this guy go? Because he's, much yeah, okay, well, here we go. You stay there with them. Oh, what will we do here? We'll, we'll, yeah. Go on, Just shout it out loud. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe repeat that question. So, f so you find it a struggle to, 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 to define between between oak, beech, apple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How good's your palate? I mean, this is not a horribly leading question. Yeah, okay. So, and uh, I mean, it depends what you're looking for. I'll give you an example. When you eat smoked salmon, what wood's that? Yeah, mostly oak. So that becomes defining part of that. If you eat salmon or trout that's been cooked over apple, it's got a much more smooth vanilla note in the background. So they're nuanced. They're like spices or ingredients. If you, if you cook over oak, if you, if you eat Texas barbecue, Texas barbecue is basically four ingredients, yeah? Which is uh, brisket, beef, salt, pepper, and then it's American post oak. And each one of those are part of the recipe. So that distinctive tarry note is the oak. So it depends how long you're cooking it in. And um, so the f the anything fatty will take up the aromatic. So it depends at what point you're cooking your beef over the wood that it's going to pick up the aromatic in the fat notes or the proteins. So it's really a sort of technical thing. Um, and sometimes a bit of beef will, if you've cooked it first and then you rest it away, if it's near the oak fire, that's when it will pick up an aromatic that you might be looking for, a particular woody note. And so it's quite nuanced. And it really it's about when you take the opportunity to expose it to the aromatic compounds that wood makes. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, but it's a subtle thing, yeah. And also as well, it depends when you eat as well, what time in the day. And if you, like a, for instance as well, if you smoke a chicken, like over applewood, and I do, I do it with the whole spatch caught chicken, and then let it chill, cool it the next day, and, and maybe have it in something like a Caesar salad, the smoke will be much more prolific. Yeah, because it gets a chance to transmit and penetrate. So it's, it's a nuanced thing, hence why smoked salmon tastes more, more rich. Does that answer all or some of your question? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What bits left that you didn't get quite answered? Yeah. Yeah. So the question's about grapevine wood. And this gentleman didn't get on very well with it. More, I think. <laughs> so maybe it's more about the is it more about the palate mark? Is that where No, no, it's a, it's it's like for instance the, the original recipe, you roast the you roast so Cote de Boeuf, which the, you're talking about is a, a dish called entrecote bordelaise. So the, the classic bordelaise is, is, a, is a, a rib on beef, um, and then it's, it's shallots, butter, and red wine. And then the, you, the, the classic version, you roast the bone marrows in the wood ash, and that's where you get the aromatic. When you roast the bone marrow, because it's the fattiest part, and then that goes into the sauce. But anyway, this is about... It is, we'll get back to that. Any further questions about wood? Fine, Mark Parr, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. So, um, Linda, <laughs> we're back to you again, darling. I know you're trying desperately here to get this chicken cooked. <laughs> Can you talk to me? What is this chicken it's marinated? What's been marinated in? What's what, what have you? Yeah. It's got uh, yellow chili powder. So there's uh, yellow chili that is um, found in abundance in Lucknow in um, in India, and that's the only state that has it, and it has a very nice flavor. Plus, I've got the Naga Bhut ghost chili. Uh, Bhujalokya, which is a ghost pepper in it. I've got butter. Um, I've got ginger garlic paste. 
and then uh, I'm going to drizzle more of the ghost pepper oil on top and okay. chat masala. And how long has it been marinating in those sauces for? The for about two hours. Two hours marinating with yeah. all those amazing ingredients. Yeah. Because I know you're a big fan of bold flavors. Yes. Right. Where did that love of bold come from? Is it typically Indian? Is it? Yeah, I think uh, Indian cuisine is a sleeping giant and there's just way so much to discover in it. And it is about bold flavors and there's it's misrepresented world over. And there's just a little segment of Indian cuisine which is known to people. There's just so much more that is still... Uh, I have to do something about it. <laughs> well, I suppose, I'm going to think, you know, when you think of Indian food, what do you guys think of? Is Butter that about it? Sh She's going to get you for that. Yeah, so obviously that's, yeah, I understand. So that it's, just, it's pretty much butter chicken and dal makhani and naan that is known to people. But, uh, you know, as you travel from north to south, east to west, the cuisine completely changes. The cooking techniques change, the ingredients change. And so, yeah, there's... Well, what do you think, with a population of a billion people, it has to. You know, how can, <laughs> how, can, how can you have the one ingredient, you know, serving all those people? It would be absolutely yeah. crazy. But tell me, for example, in your restaurant in Arth right now, today, what's yeah. on the menu? So um, there's ran biryani on the menu, there's kakori kebabs. Um, so ran biryani is the whole leg of goat, which is slow cooked for about six hours on an angiti. So I have all custom designed equipment at my restaurant. So I cook on angitis in heavy bottom copper lagans. So it's a leg of goat with basmati rice and saffron, which is our signature dish. That's on now the menu. Now to slow you down there, she just mentioned that she worked with a heavy bottomed copper lagan. Yeah. Can you just explain to everybody what that is and where did you learn that or who did you learn that from? I learned that from the royal kitchens of Patiala. The granddaughter of Maharaja Bhupender Singh of Patiala um, had family heirloom recipes from her royal kitchens and she shared those with me. And um, she was the person who told me that, you know, even things like bengan bharta, which is a simple dish, but when it's cooked on over woods in a copper lagan, tastes absolutely different with with even a simple fulka. So um, it's a big, it's um, almost like a paya pan. So it's flatter, not so deep, and it's heavy bottom and it's made of copper. And like everybody else here today, you're cooking straight on charcoal back in India, right? Yes. That's what you're cooking on. So is there any gas? Do you have any gas there? No, I have no gas in what, my None kitchen. whatsoever? No. Even to gauge stuff, even to kind of figure out temperature of stuff, not using gas no at all? No gas, no regulator on any of my equipment. So how do you regulate? So it's my, the cooking at my restaurant is a lot about the organic touch and feel of food. And um, so m most of the cooks in my kitchen, um, I mean, it's hard to find a team. So, you know, there are a lot of people who come for interviews and then I show them my kitchen and I say, you have to, this is where you have to do a trial and they don't show up for the job the next day. <laughs> so the ones I have, um, their style of cooking is a lot like mine where it's uh, very intuitive and it's about touch and feel and look of food, so. Is that way of cooking quite unconventional in India? It is. I mean, that's how we started. Uh, but it used to be the way, right? Th it so used to be the way, and then we forgot it midway, and I'm now trying to revive that. Some of the forgotten techniques and lost recipes and... Are there many trying to revive that, or is it just your good self waving the flag? <laughs> um, I'm the only one who has an absolutely gas-free kitchen. Can we give a round of applause, please? <laughs> the only one without a gas-free kitchen. An incredible woman working in India with a gas-free kitchen. So talk Thank to me you. about, you're a great believer in traditional, elaborate, and skill sensitive. Yes. Right? So just explain, give me, expand that for on, on, on that for us. So for example, like kakori kebabs that's on my menu is very, very finely ground and there's a special spit that you have to make for it. It has special skewers. And even to put that fine mince onto a skewer so that it doesn't slide down is skill that you learn after um, trying it out many times and then you rotate it four times and then you s knock it once and then slide it off the skewer. So. Um, even to emulsify that mixture with ghee takes time. So it took me time to learn that and that's the reason I put that on the menu so that you know I'm able to, um, more people learn about, like even a trainee in my kitchen now knows how to make kakori kebabs. Well, I was gonna say, when you're employing people, so yeah. you're employing chefs, it must be quite difficult. I mean, they have to have a certain skill set, right? Yeah. So do you have a process where you'll train these people? Or do you have no time for that? They've got to have the skill set and they've got to be able to come in and do no, the job. No, so I have a mix of seasoned as well as absolute beginners in my kitchen. And I think if you're passionate about cooking, you will get it and you will not give up. 
you know. Yeah. Like we, for this Bharma Tangri Kebab that I made for Metopia, um, there was a doctor who's born and brought up in um, England, but he's an Indian origin uh, guy and he really wanted to learn from me. So he came and he couldn't put the sea kebabs on the skewer, but all day for like four, four hours, he kept trying till he got it. He got one skewer in the end, but he did not give up. So, so I think if, if you have that. So if, you, if we show that to you, will you give me a job in your restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Does preparation, therefore, if you're working in the gas-free environment, does prep take longer? Prep takes longer. It does. Is that there a cost you? But that's a cost you can live with. You don't mind. Yeah, I mean, the because the end result the great, is the end result is worth beautiful, it. Beautiful, yeah. Um, so, so, what are the key skills? You talk about the, the, the hanging of the kebabs. You talk about that. What other key skills do you look for in a chef who's coming in? to work in that environment? If it's someone who I'm hiring for the tandoor, then um, I really look for people who can make a rumali roti because if you know how to make a rumali roti, there's so much more that you can do because it's super skill sensitive. Um, how they knead the dough because all our doughs are, we knead them by hand, we don't use any machines. All our chutneys are ground on the silbata, all the dry masalas are in a mortar and pestle. So I think people who have patience and are passionate is pretty much what you need. What I look for, yeah. Talk to me about, it. you've got a custom sand pit in your restaurant, is that right? Yes. I mean, how does a person build a custom sand pit? Is it just digging a hole in the ground? <laughs> <laughs> how do you do it? So it looks like a tandoor. It's a Hang on, it looks like a what? Like a tandoor. I don't know what that is. Explain to me what that is. Uh, <laughs> tandoor is a clay oven. Okay. And then it's insulated in a stainless steel body, so you see a square box, and between the clay oven and the stainless steel body, there's glass wool, which helps in insulation. So, I, so my sand pit looks like the tandoor. It's got a cavity inside, which is filled with sand, and then there's a tray underneath that I use to feed live charcoal. I bring the temperature up to about 60 degrees centigrade, and then I cook a whole goat, on, goat in it overnight. Whole goats? Yeah, so I marinate the goat for a for a day, and then I cook it for a day. So there's a pre-order of two days to have that goat. Yeah, so what happens if nobody orders goat? It's a bit of, you know, an important. <laughs> Has anybody got any questions for this amazing person? Because remember, we only have her on stage for a few more minutes. We've got a question over here, the VIP section. Hello, 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 hello. Yellow Say again? The yellow chili powder. The, ye the yellow spice that you use. What is it? Yeah, what is it? The yellow chili powder, Amlinda, that you're using. What is it? Sorry? The yellow chili powder you're being asked about. Yeah. It's a yellow chili? We call it Peely Mitch, which literally translates yeah, you need to, write that to yellow chili. <laughs> Yeah, I have it here. I can show it to you. But it's, yeah, of course. So where can you source that? Can you get that at your local? You, you get it in Delhi in North India. You don't get it in South India. <laughs> I'll show it to you. Who's got a question from Ninder? Don't be shy. Oh, you got a question. Fabulous. Fabulous. What's your name, sweetheart? Evie. Evie, what's your question? What's your favorite? You Maybe get all Indian ingredients here in London. I was so pleasantly surprised. Wherever I've cooked all over the world, and I usually travel with a suitcase of ingredients. Where did and you get them? Sorry? Where did you get them? So, <laughs> so these Metopia organizers, they got everything. So I was waiting for them to send me an email saying, you know, we can't get this, can't get that. And not a thing, everything was available here, yeah. Can I pass on Evie's question, please? Which was, what is your favorite curry? My favorite curry? <laughs> so my favorite curry is, um, I call it the Sunday mutton curry on my menu. It's my mom's recipe. And when we were growing up in Assam, 
Um, we used to play a lot outdoors and then we would come home and my brother wouldn't even let me and my mom used to make that was Sunday lunch every Sunday and my brother wouldn't even let her transfer it into a portion bowl so she would just put the pressure cooker on the table and the whistle would go off on the table and we would eat out of that so I try and recreate that memory so on my menu it's called the Sunday mutton curry it comes in a little pressure cooker whistle on the table served with short grain fragrant rice called koni joha from Assam. Are you happy with that answer Evie? Yay! What's your name? My name's Nadine. What's your question? Do you think that English tastes are getting um, more refined to actual Indian flavors rather than the British Indian flavors that were brought over to begin with? Do you hear that? No. no. Can you ask that again? <laughs> Do you think that we're getting um, better at eating real Indian flavors than the Indian flavors that were brought over to begin with that weren't really true to Indian flavors? I lost in the As in us Brits, are we getting better <laughs> yes, uh, with I our I think uh, so. real yeah. Indian food? Getting on with real Indian food. Are we getting better? I think so, yeah. And there's a lot that I saw here at this event as well. Um, where the pe there's f uh, there are some dishes from Kerala, you know, there was a goat curry yesterday by Brigadier, so I think, I really feel, yeah. How long before we can serve, guys? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> are we minutes six, away? Six, seven minutes. Six or seven minutes. Who's got a question before food comes out to taste? Any questions about Mumbai? Hello, my love. What's your name? Bachi. I like it. Go okay, for it. Uh, so maybe you'd like to tell the British audience that there is, isn't really an Indian curry. Right, Hajit? Hello? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know why I'm looking into my phone is because my colleague is going back to Bachi. India right now. I'm going to ask the question out loud. So I just wanted you to tell the British audience that, you know, they say think of an Indian curry and there isn't anything really Could like an Indian curry. Yeah. What a great question. Ladies, put your hands together for this lady. How confident so are you? That's you my job next year. boss lady from Times of India. So pretty much curry is a bastardized term that is used for anything that's in gravy, uh, which really isn't the case. Um, Indian food is a lot about regional. So, you know, you should know every dish has a name. Um, and not everything that's gravy is a curry. Is that answer good enough, ma'am? Yeah, I guess so, yes. <laughs> yeah, because I've had a lot of problem with people saying Indian curry, and yeah. it's basically the Goans and the Parsis, like yeah. us, yeah. who have a curry, as is understood, yeah. and it's not Madras curry powder. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. You, you, you do this gig for me next year, will you? God, you're fantastic. Hello, buddy. What's your name? Charlie. Uh, are there some some other Indian chefs who you admire, either working in India or in elsewhere Hello? abroad? She's actually on the phone. She's hilarious, isn't she? Uh, who wants to tell a joke? <laughs> Is it clean? Because we've got a very small child here. Okay, here's a joke. What do you call a chicken looking at salad? Chicken sees a salad. Round of applause for the joker. <laughs> now I forgot your question. Did you want to send it to you, Molly? Other, other Indian yes. Super question. Okay. Avinder, are you off that phone yet? <laughs> She's off the phone, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really sorry. That's my all right, colleague is traveling. The question back was: the question yeah. was, yeah. who in the Indian world do you look up to as Indian chefs? Other Indian chefs that you might look up to? Um. Or find inspirational? None. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much Indian chefs, but I really look up to Nikki Singh, who's the granddaughter of Maharaja Bhupender Singh of Patiala, and I've learned a lot from her, and she's always shared a lot of knowledge. Um, and yeah, so she's, she's my inspiration. Who else has got a question? Four minutes to food, so we haven't got long. I've got a question. I've got a question. No, got questions over here now. You talk about homogenous taste. Sorry. Homogenous taste. Yes. What does that mean? 
I think with, we cook with so much spice and there are a lot of ingredients in most of our dishes. And so to be able to get that balance where um, use of spice doesn't really mean that you add a lot of the spices into your food, but just getting that fine, delicate balance is um, what I think Indian cuisine is all about and getting that homogenous. And you're a fan of slow cooking? Oh, yeah. Slow it's always cooking. low and slow with these guys, isn't yeah. it? Unless it was that burger, of course, the Rosita Deluxe burger. That was in and out. Right, we've got, we got two more questions. I'll come to you in one second. That's okay. John, isn't it? Go for it, dude. Um, spices. So what we buy in the supermarket, I understand, are already pre-roasted, even if they're whole. So the whole idea of like roasting a spice to get more flavor out of it, I understand that what we buy is pre-roasted, so you're actually even burning it. So we need to buy fresh spices, is what I understand. Is that correct? Good question. Uh, I'm in there. <laughs> no, the question is, are fresh spices very important? That we don't buy pre-cooked ones. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so what we buy in the supermarket is already cooked. I think more than the spices is the fresh paste that are very important. Like um, even simple things like ginger garlic paste out of a, a bottle is not, not as good as you would like a freshly made ginger garlic paste. So for those who can't hear that, yeah, in I India they buy from markets. So where can we buy it fresh? Do we know? I don't know. Is where that what you're asking? I, but in India, I work with a lot of farmers who are in and around Mumbai, and I source a lot of my ingredients from the Northeast, which are not necessarily looked at as Indian ingredients, like Sheswan peppercorn leaf, and uh, you know, really tiny potatoes called gutti alu. I use a lot of bamboo. I use alpinia leaf, things like that, which are still not looked at as Indian ingredients. Here, I'm sorry, I wouldn't know. Uh, yeah. So. So I have specific, like my black peppercorn comes from Kerala, I get cardamom from down south, whereas the yellow chili from up north. So from, from wherever the places of origin where you know you get the best quality is where I source the spices from. Are we any closer to serving food? Obviously, I don't want to poison anybody, but we need to start serving soon because we're running yeah. over. We're two yeah. minutes. I'm getting a two-minute hand signal. Brilliant. Yes. There's a question over here. What's your name? I didn't even ask your name last time. Okay. Sue. Hi, Libby's mom. What's the question? I'm going to New Delhi next May, and um, where should I go and eat, and what should I eat in New Delhi that I'm not going to have found in other parts of India that I've been to? What should this lady eat in New Delhi when she goes there? Oh, you must go to Old Delhi. Um, it's beautiful. This is so vibrant. There's so many different um, dishes to eat there. So you should totally have the Nalini Nihari. You should have the mutton stew. You should go to this place called Karim's and uh, have like almost everything from their menu. <laughs> I'm going to, I'll give you all the, I will do that. She's yeah. going to just sit with you for about 10 minutes after this. Do you realize that? She's going to give you the ingredients, the spice, the details of where to get the spice <laughs> and where to eat. And unbelievable. Anybody else traveling to go to Mumbai or New Delhi? Or anything like that. Who else has got a question? Not long till you eat. Hello. Lifesaver. Love a question. What's your name? Natasha. Where are you from? Uh, London. You're very welcome. Is this your first time in Metopia? No. Seventh time in Metopia? Second time. Second time. Well done. Congratulations. So, uh, what's your question? Uh, I just wonder if you had any recommendations for cooking fish. Any recommendations for cooking fish? Um, in a gravy or... Like a uh, dry fish. Um, I really like cooking fish wrapped in banana leaf. So if you made a masala of charred onion and tomatoes and put a little bit of ginger garlic and uh, tamarind in it and slit green chilies and then have your fish and smear that masala on it, wrap it in banana leaf and then you can even cook it on a flat top or in an oven and it'll be really nice. Any other questions? Don't be shy, there's only minutes left. No? Sure? I got a question. <laughs> when are we serving? <laughs> what do you do for fun when you're not in the kitchen? I listen to music, um, yoga. 
I love the spa. If I could like live all day in a spa, um, travel, try um, different cuisines. M most of what I like to do even when I'm not working is about food and revolves around food. So, so uh, somebody asked a great question earlier from Brian. Do you actually cook at home? Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Only when I have friends over or I have relatives from outside India, that's when I cook. But mostly, yeah, mostly whenever I get time off, I'm sleeping at home or recovering physically. Yep. Okay, any other sort of generic? Oh, hello. I know this lady, she's amazing. <laughs> hello, sweetheart, what's your question? Well, I'm just quite interested to know what your favorite dish would be if you were feeding a large crowd. Is there something that you just no, you would definitely go for and nail it. My favorite dish um, is to cook a for a lot of people. Ran biryani. It really works for a large group. It's big. It's the whole leg of goat, and it's beautiful. Very, very fragrant. Very skill sensitive. All of that slow cooked. So I love that. Well, hang on. You're going to ask it for you. You're asking me. Ask her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Did you get the right answer? Fabulous, go for it. I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to hog all the questions. No, you're right, but make sure you put but the microphone uh, close to your mouth. You, know, you, you said that you used a lot of recipes from the royal, uh, royal kitchens. Yes. Now, the royal kitchens use royal recipes, very elaborate, very expensive, you know, brown pearl and peacock's eyes and that kind of thing. But uh, how do you really, I mean, how much of it do you, do you kind of make into like, you know, ordinary people's food? I mean, how much do you alter them or adapt them? I follow it to the T. Oh, <laughs> I don't, I don't, yeah, there, I don't cut any corners. I give that recipe the respect it deserves. Sorry, my question was, where can I buy peacock's eyes in the UK? <laughs> <laughs> I've still not found that recipe with peacock's eyes, <laughs> thankfully. Now, I'm going to talk about, uh, there's no, any other questions before I start getting into something? Any else want to? Ask a quick question. You sure? Yeah, go on. What did you say about the goat? How old is it? Baby? Well, you can ask her. Baby she don't talk about it in the Baby. third person. She's standing there on the stage. <laughs> Who? Me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So, when you say about the goat, about it cooking the whole goat, it's a baby goat. Is it, it is a baby goat. Yes. Like really the goat. leg is about a kilo and a half in oh. weight. Have you got that here now? <sighs> yeah, in her back pocket. Next year. <laughs> Right, my question is about, uh, before we start, so how long will we wait, 30 seconds? Yes. 30 seconds, everybody. It's worth the wait, trust me. <laughs> my question is about uh, sustainability. Uh, it's amazing how she zones out, isn't it? I love it. We could talk, I could ask her anything. Let's just go quiet and see what happens. Yes. Oh, hello, darling. <laughs> so my question is about sustainability. Okay, something really important, the and what Metopia do here, and what you know, all the chefs, barbecue people that we've spoken with today. How do you practice sustainability? How do you behave in a sustainable fashion with art? So at Earth, I use biocharcoal, which is made from sustainable material, and it doesn't emit any of the harmful gases because I use a lot of charcoal. That is one. Number two is I work with a lot of farmers, and we've pretty much been able to set up supply chains to these farms where they're growing um, uh, for us. And um, uh, none of what I use is about exploiting anybody or um, not using sustainable material. What about food wastage? Yeah, yeah, round of applause, absolutely. <laughs> Bigger round of applause. Minimal food wastage. So what do you do? Do you like if you've got food wastage off from one dish, do you use it in another dish? I do that. So give us an example of how you do I that. I use a lot of vegetable peels to make chutneys. Um, I use even the seeds of um, okra as a crunch um, in some of my dishes. Um, so yeah, we, we, we try and reduce wastage as much as possible. And in relation to the wood that you source, yeah. how do you behave ethically when it comes to that? So you're not just chopping down trees, you know, are you... So uh, a lot of, like I said, the biocharcoal that I use is from sustainable materials. So I use a lot of baboon wood, which is in abundance and can be used. So I use that. As far as the mango wood is concerned, only one dish on my menu is on the mango wood. So I'm not overusing it in any way. Okay. It's good. It's good, because it's really, really important to sing that hymn, you know what I mean? It's one thing that we forget to publicize a lot, I think, 
these businesses and these chefs, these extraordinary people, they really are behaving differently and they care and you care about the community and you care about what you're doing. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. But we're hungry. <laughs> we are ready. Can we get some food on? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good guys, we're surfing up. It's good we news. Get yeah. Now, as you're serving, anybody else want to ask any questions? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll be asking your opinions on the chicken in a second. Can we start chopping up the chicken? Brilliant. Okay. Let's start chopping up the food. I want to ask you a question. Yes. If you could eat at any restaurant in the world, yours excluded, where would you eat? I was blown out of my mind at Cor, and I would eat that every day. Cor by Claire Smith, I think, is... Unbelievable. Say that again. Sorry, I missed it. Core, yeah. C-O-R-E by Claire Smith, Chef Claire Smith. Yeah. Okay. I think it's. Where is that? Where is that restaurant? Oh, I forget the Catherine Square. I forget the name of the area. Okay, but it's London. Here in London. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And what would you particularly have there that was so delicious and blue? I away? had their classics, uh, the their tasting menu, which had all the classic uh, dishes on it. It was unbelievable. Oh, guys, I hope you're getting hungry. Can we start chopping into this? Yes. We literally have 30 seconds. <laughs> you can't go when the food's being served. It's... <laughs> 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 Okay, what's happening here? What sauces are we using here? This is the chaat masala. This is the naga bhut jalokia oil. And this is lime juice. Lime juice, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So can we start chopping yes, now? Yes, yes. Come seconds on. and seconds and seconds. What dish do you love eating at home? What dish do you love eating at home? What's your comfort food? My comfort food is tandoori chicken. How do you cook that? What is that? It's, it's in a marinade of um, yogurt, red chilies, and uh, ginger garlic, kasuri methi, a um, little bit of garam masala, jeera powder. That's my comfort food. I eat that a lot. Okay. Well, wash your fingers, please, love. <laughs> Don't worry about it. What piece it. of kitchen equipment? I mean, look at that knife. <laughs> what piece of kitchen equipment could you not live without? Um, a lemon zester. Say again? Zester. I don't know what that is. Who knows what that is? Microplane. <laughs> zester. Oh, well, zester. Sorry. I need the lemon bit first to understand what a lemon zester is. You <laughs> get me? Well, that's fair enough. Okay, brilliant. Okay, I'm going to start putting these out. Should we start offering some people? I think at the back. Wait, let me. Watch wait, me. Wait, no. wait, wait, wait. No, you didn't even. Listen, first of all, it's people who ask questions are getting the food first. Oh, you go, yeah, all right, all right, wait all right. Wait one, mi one minute. Sorry, darling. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. All right, those who ask. So oh, gosh. The Hello. strongest chili in the world. I nearly forgot it. You got your cold beer next to you, you know, you drank it now, you see. Now, what are you going to do with your chili? Uh, famous last words. Famous last words. What is that you're sprinkling on, is the Chaat question. Chaat masala. <laughs> it's got cumin, dry mango. Is the chili in there? Yeah. Amazing. Uh, who asked a question? Put your hand up. No, hang on. You didn't ask a question. What was your question? 100%. 100%. Yeah, a little bit. Don't worry, don't worry. Little in the boat and this. Can I ask, is that one ready to go? Yes. Not yet. I'm just going to take a fork there because yeah. I think John asked about 17 Lime questions just today. A few drops and this a few drops. You see, guys, remember for next year, those who ask questions get free food. <laughs> yeah. Come we just chopping up. Good. Can I grab? Is that one to go? See you. Look at this guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, he didn't ask a question. It's terrible. There's amazing food coming out. Gentleman in the back. Look at his eyes. Look at those eyes back there. Okay, which one is ready to go? Those are. I just thought I think I promised the guy who asked the question. It's not ready yet. <laughs> right. Okay. Good. Sorry, 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 sorry. There you go, sir. 
You're welcome. Don't worry, there's loads coming out. Now, who's had a taste? John, I'm going to go back to you because I want to see what you think, what sort of tastes are going on for you, yeah? Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, look at the microphone. The question is, what sort of tastes are buzzing around inside your mouth right now? Thank you. The mango is beautiful, yeah? Sweetness of it is like, yeah. It's just complex and beautiful. <laughs> complex and beautiful, okay. just like him. Right, you're mid I like talking to guys who are mid-taste. How many? Right, Mr. I can handle a spice. Don't you dare after getting all <laughs> cocky with me for that spice. It's, spicy, it's, it's delicious, though. It's really good. It's delicious, but it's not spicy. I He can handle it. He can handle it. What do you think? It's very good. It's very good. It's not really spicy, actually. And I'm, I'm normally pretty bad on spice. Yeah, because the chili has a really nice smoky flavor to it. So it's not so much for the heat that I love to use it. It's Yeah, but I was just trying to scare everyone by going on. You are pouring an absolute sweat, by the way. I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> Telling me it's not spicy. Who else here is mid-taste? Is this spicy to you? Uh, not particularly. It's beautiful, though. Beautiful, but not particularly spicy. We'll take that. Yourself? Okay. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Lovely seasoning, but not yeah. spicy. Not spicy. The hottest pepper in the world, I have my doubts. Yes, sir. Oh, are people forgetting that spice is not heat? Are people forgetting that spice is not heat? <laughs> Good shout. Mid-taste, gentlemen. Go for it. Can I make a reservation? <laughs> Can you fly to Mumbai? No problem. <laughs> what about yourself? What do you think? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yourself, sir? It's for Mark. Yeah. 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 That's better than no. Yes, sir. Did you get any now? Is that what you're asking for? <laughs> Instinctively ask for a dish or ask a question? Well, you're more than welcome to ask. We've got a question. Oh, God, now I'm on the spot. I don't have one. Um. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Any questions, guys? A bit more about the food. Who's feeling it really spicy? Yeah? Guy at the back who didn't taste it. It's an after. What's your name? Rebecca, what's your question? Which one's spicy, a Carolina Reaper or a ghost pepper? I didn't get that. Can you say that really slowly? Which one is spicy, a Carolina Reaper or a ghost pepper? Ghost pepper is spicier. Good question. It was a mango salad. We got a we got a spelling question here. How do you spell ghost pepper? G H O S T. As in the spooky ghost. Yeah. As in Ghostbusters. Yeah. yeah. Nice one. Nice job, dude. Are you okay? You're just looking for some food. Anybody else got a question for you? Let's lady go. Going, going, gone. Put your hands together, please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank She's you. She's so amazing. Much. Thank you. Next time you're in Mumbai, thank you. Ten minutes, last live demo, Sam Evans. Thank you. <laughs>